And there was a really interesting, not just interesting, I think that's an understatement, terrifying, but very well-respected study that came out a few months ago showing that if there were a blackout during a heat wave in Phoenix, within 48 hours, half of the population, almost 400,000 people, would be in the emergency room and of hospitals and 13,000 people would be dead within 48 hours. I mean, that is a horrific thing to consider, but true. Hello, welcome back to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director. Today, we're beginning a new series by considering the multiple uncertainties of life on our planet. We begin by looking at the ever-warming planet to examine some of the damaging repercussions of climate change. Wildfire escalations, crop impacts, human health effects, property loss, disease, and of course, death. I regret making such a doleful list, but facts are facts. Our inability to make governments mandate fossil fuel producers to meet emission targets has failed us miserably. So we are now marooned, trying to deal with the looming consequences with little or no guidance, but a deep sense of dread. Scientists, journalists, and environmental activists, of course, are doing their thing, and they're certainly trying to create change. Groups of concerned citizens are winning legal battles in court. 16 young environmentalists in Montana recently won their case against the state government for failing to protect their future constitutionally by denying them, quote, a clean and healthful environment. Montana is one of the several states, Massachusetts is another, that have included a green amendment to their constitution in the 1970s. Well, to look at the scale and the implications of a hot, hot planet, we have two guest speakers with us today. Jeff Goodall is a best-selling New York Times author and contributing editor at Rolling Stone, where he's been covering climate change for over two decades. He's authored several books, and the latest is The Heat Will Kill You First, Life and Death on a Scorched Planet. We also welcome Mike Flanagan, who's the scientific director of the Canadian Partnership for Wildland Fire Science, and he holds a research chair at Thompson Rivers University in British Columbia. Welcome to you both. Great to be here. Happy to be here. Okay, Jeff, you've written this wonderfully comprehensive book on the topic of heat. It's uh, panoramic in its reach, yet it's deeply personal in the stories that you tell us. You say the goal of the book is to convince people to think about heat in a different way, that it's widely misunderstood. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, let me, I guess the best way to explain this is to tell you a little just about the genesis of the book. So, um, you know, as you mentioned, I've been covering climate change for a couple of decades now. But about five years ago, um, I happened to be in Phoenix on a hot day. It was 115 degrees. I had to walk about 15 blocks downtown uh, to a meeting. And by the time I got to the meeting, 15 blocks away, um, I was dizzy and my heart was pounding. And I realized, oh, my goodness, this is this heat is brutal and it has powerful impact on me. And I don't know what would happen to me if I had to walk another 15 blocks in this in this kind of extreme heat. And that sounds maybe, you know, elementary or really simple. But the fact is, I had been covering climate change for 15 years and talked about warming and ice sheets melting and all of the other impacts of a warming planet. But I had never thought about it as an active force, as something that can kill you quickly if you're stuck in it in the wrong circumstances or if you don't understand the risks. And I realized that if I didn't understand the risks of heat and how dangerous it was to me and to my life, that I bet a lot of other people didn't either. And so I really started to think about this a little bit. And I realized that most people really don't 
think about heat as this sort of active force that has real human health risks, as well as risks to all other kind of living creatures also. And moreover, when I thought about it a little bit, I realized that I didn't even know what heat was. Um, and, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit this, but I knew what temperature was. But if you would have asked me to explain what is heat, uh, I would not have had a good answer. So that was sort of the genesis of the book. So do you want to talk just a little bit more about that differential there, about the vibration factor, the molecular vibration that comes about with heat, as opposed to just the temperature going up on? We can all see it going up. Right. So, you know, we all know what temperature is. We all know the difference between 50 degrees and 60 degrees or or whatever. Um, but, you know, it was the idea of what actually heat is uh, was something that was of much scientific dispute for a long time. In the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, there was a lot of theories about what it is. Is it like light? Is it a wave that travels? Is it um, some invisible fluid? Um, there was something called the caloric theory, which we still get the word calorie from, is derived from that. Um, is there an inexhaustible supply of heat? Is this something that's man a manufactured? What, what exactly is it? And to make a long story short, what he, what these 18th century scientists kind of finally figured out, and I talk about some of these experiments in the book, is that heat can best be described as vibration, and that a, fa a hotter world is a world that is vibrating more quickly. So when you put your hand on a coffee cup and you feel the warmth in your hand, what is actually molecules in the coffee cup are vibrating faster, and they're transferring that vibration to the molecules in your fingertips, which is then re being registered in your brain as heat. Nothing is actually passing between your the coffee cup and your fingertips except this motion, and that motion is heat. And so when we think about a hotter world, I mean, one way to think about it is a world that is vibrating faster, that has a faster metabolism. And we're attached to it <clears throat> rather than detached from it. We're part of it. Yeah. Right. Right. <clears throat> it's interesting. You have a lot of examples in the book of how heat is being played out in various parts of the world, uh, especially amongst the poorest. But um, one of the starkest examples, I think, probably here that we um, were all exposed to was that story in California. I think it was last autumn with the young couple and their baby, the, the Garish family. And they died uh, hiking in just a few hours. And it took obviously took them totally by surprise. But it even took the people investigating their deaths by surprise. They looked everywhere else. And then finally they said, this was heat stroke. So can you highlight and just tell us a little about the two different kinds of heat stroke? Yeah, well, first of all, I wanted to you know include this story in, um, in the book about this family that died. Um, uh, on a an ordinary on a on a you know a relatively modest hike a seven mile hike on a California uh, hillside on a summer day, just to really underscore that um, heat is something that is dangerous to us all. I mean, this family was was young in their thirties and forties. Um, they were in good shape. Um, they just were in the wrong place. They were ended up climbing up a south facing slope. Um, uh, on a really sunny day, there was no shade. There was they made some bad decisions about not retreating back into the lower altitudes and thinking that they could just push through and that maybe it was hot, but they would be fine. And you know they ended up dead. But but it, it was a very tragic story. But it really underscores the um, idea that we're all vulnerable to this. It's not just outdoor workers or older people with heart conditions or something like that. Uh, so the different kinds of you know heat. Uh, there's two, two basically different kinds of heat stroke. And one is the kind of kind of passive heat stroke that, you know, you, you know, is most familiar to people like with children who are stuck in hot cars, right? The temperature just, you're in an environment where the temperature just gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And, you know, you, your body cannot compensate for that rising heat by sweating. Sweating is the one mechanisms our bodies have to dissipate heat. And it works fine to a certain level. Um, but if you're in you know, a hot car or if you're locked in a hot sauna or if you're stuck in the desert on a hot day, um, you know, there's a, your body cannot 
dissipate that kind of heat. Your in, internal body temperature rises, um, causes all kinds of problems, including heart stress, which a lot of people end up dying from before the, the more complicated consequences such as cellular melting and things like that that happens in your bodies at higher temperatures. That's one thing. The other is exertional heat stroke, which can happen what happened to that family when they're hiking. As you are moving, your body is generating heat. That's what, you know, as you use your muscles, that generates heat. So I think most people understand this intuitively. If you're out on a hot day and you're sitting down or if you're sitting in the shade, it's very different than if you're up on the roof and you're pounding nails or if you're carrying a backpack or if you're working in a field as a laborer. Um, there's exertional heat stroke. So um, that is a, a, a completely different kind of danger and risk. It still causes the same problem, which is an uncontrollable rise of body heat, but it can happen much faster. And in, one thing I just want to stress is that in those kinds of situations, water is important, but will not save you. In other words, as as Mike probably knows, a lot of wildfire fighters can be out working, fighting a wildfire. There's been a lot of studies on this and can have heat stroke, even though they have plenty of water, simply because they're working so hard, wearing heavy equipment that they can't dissipate the heat. So water is really important in, you know, keeping our body hydrated so that we can sweat and all that, but water itself does not save you. Well, I guess you get past the point of no return where your core, you can't cool the core of your body. That's reached such a temperature. It's affecting things, systems are starting to break down. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, you know, the heat stroke and, you know, heat death is all about the, you know, the rising of your internal body temperature. And if you get into a situation where you're having, you know, in heat exhaustion heading towards heat stroke, uh, you know, the only thing to do, the only solution is to lower your body temperature. Um, depending on how high it is, you know, it doesn't take much. Once you get to 104, 105 degrees, you're heading into real trouble. 106, 107, and you're in, you know, you're in serious risk of dying. But there's no medicine, there's no drug. If you go to the emergency room, they will pack you in ice immediately. There's nothing that can be done other than getting your body temperature down as quickly as possible. So anybody who's having who's in a situation where they're having heat um, uh, exhaustion or heat stroke, the only and most urgent thing to do is to get out of the heat and lower your body temperature. Good, good point. So you also list a lot of other kinds of havoc in the world that are being played out, some of which we're, we're unaware of. Um, you take us on a trajectory that goes into the kind of minutiae. We look at the impact on plants and animals and fish and insects, and then parasites and microbes, all these things, some of which thrive in the heat. And, and so this is gonna cause subsequent migrations, both of insect populations, animal populations, and, and humans. So I know it's hard to condense a book in a few sentences, but could you just fill us in on some of the details that you that you unearthed when you were researching the book? Well, I, I think uh, I'll start with the idea that, you know, um, all living things have what scientists call a, a Goldilocks zone, which is, you know, a, a, it's, this term comes from scientists who look for life in outer space and they look for planets that have liquid water that are either not too cold so that it's all ice or not too hot so that it's all um, evaporated. And so, you know, we as humans and all living things have evolved in this certain kind of Goldilocks zone, which we are comfortable in and we can manage and our bodies thrive in. And that is true, not just for humans, but it's true for plants. It's true for insects. It's true for all living things. In fact, it's true for many non-living things like your iPhone and things like that also. But for living things, um, for staying in this Goldilocks zone is really important. So when it gets too hot, um, things move. Um, uh, frogs jump higher, uh, climb higher on a mountain to seek higher elevation for cooler altitudes. Um, you know, humans move to cooler places. Fish migrate to cooler waters. Um, everything has to find a this this Goldilocks zone, and if it can't, it dies. 
Um, this is why coral reefs are in so much trouble uh, because of the warming ocean. Coral reefs can't just swim to cooler waters. They are stuck where they are. They do not. They can migrate over evolutionary time, but they can't migrate over uh, the kind of um, scale of these changes that we're seeing right now. So that's why they are all in big trouble. And a lot of the, there's a lot of complexity to all this, but you know the the two things I'll highlight. One is um, food uh, crops. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time reporting in Texas. Um, a lot of crops there are at their thermal limits. You know, if it gets it, it, with these extreme heat waves, corn begins to fail, wheat begins to fail. They can't handle the heat. Uh, and similarly, as we get hotter areas, we have things like mosquitoes, which are very mobile and are highly sensitive to heat, beginning to move into new areas. And these mosquitoes carry things with them, like dengue, like uh, Zika, to um, uh, diseases that are um, uh, very dangerous to humans. And we're, we've even seen in the last couple of months a resurgence of malaria in the southern United States and a couple of places. All of this is a result of mosquitoes moving to their new Goldilocks zones. So when we think about heat, it's about this rearranging of life on, on this planet that has all kinds of um, obvious and not so obvious consequences. Well, um, Mike, Professor Mike Flanagan up there in British Columbia, let's let's move over to you now. Um, and we, as we were discussing before the program began, when Jeff was saying, oh, you know, I used to think British Columbia was a nice, cool place to move to. Well, not so right now for you, Mike. So you were featured in a New York Times piece that I saw last month um, coming from a chap called Serge Schmenman in Quebec. And um, is it possible, do you have the chance to read yes. the beginning of the piece? Sure. Us? Yeah. And as the summer unfolded, it became evident that's not just smoke and not just Canada. This has been the summer from climate hell all across the earth. When it ceased being possible to escape or deny what we have done to our planet and ourselves, says Professor Michael Flanagan of Thompson River University in Kamloops, British Columbia, who has been studying the interaction of fire and climate for over 35 years. Temperatures are rising at the rate we thought they would but the effects are more severe, more frequent, more critical. It's crazy and it's getting crazier. So Mike, you're a fire specialist and you live only six miles from, from fires that are still burning in Kamloops. Kamloops, British Columbia. Kamloops, yep. So how has your own life been affected apart from the fact that the university students, I imagine, have been impacted by these fires? And what's so different about this year well, first I'll talk about, you know, smoke, okay? It is a pain in the butt. And, you know, after a while, if you're not careful, the air quality in your house can be as bad or worse than outdoors. We have four air purifiers in our house to deal with the smoke. I'm a fire guy. I'm tired of this smoke, just like people are tired of the heat. And the thing about smoke is you can be in New York City, likelihood of your place burning down from wildland fire is essentially zero. But your quality of life can be in the tank because of smoke from a fire a thousand miles away. And that's an indirect impact and it's significant. Approximately 340,000 people every year die prematurely due to wildland fire smoke. And it's only going to get worse. So what's going on? Um, 2023, and maybe we can put up a graphic here for those who can view. It's a record-breaking year. It's uncharted territory. It's crazy. So for those listening, it shows area burned by date. So May, June, July, August, and the line. And 2023 is head and shoulders. I would say even more. It's like two head and shoulders above the rest of the years, which are way down near the x-axis. So that's what's going on in Canada. And maybe we can go to the next graphic and we can talk about BC and then we'll talk about why this is all happening. So this graph on the x-axis shows the, our modern record of area burned in my province of British Columbia from 1950 to 2023. 
the last seven years, 2017 to 2023, uh, four of those years stick out like sore thumbs. They're, once again, they're head and shoulders above everything else. In fact, those seven years have burned more than the previous 58 years from 1959 to 2016. It, it's, it's very abrupt, and that's what we're seeing right now. And you can remove the graphic if you want, because now I'm going to talk about what's going on here, okay? And to help us understand, there's a simple recipe for wildfire. It has three ingredients, and this applies to Canada, the United States, the Amazon. First, you need vegetation. Fire people call it fuel. How much, what type, how dry? You need ignition, people and lightning. Third, hot, dry, windy weather. And you get all three, and you have a fire. So what's happened this year is that we had extreme fire weather all across the country. And this is very unusual. Usually it's in the West or in the East or Central, but it was the entire country was on fire. And not just for a day or two, it started in the West with record-breaking heat. And I'll talk, Jeff, about heat and fire because there's a strong connection here and thus climate change. So you saw this extreme fire weather persist over large parts of the country. And that's why we're seeing this record-breaking year. Right now, we burned the area equivalent of the state of Georgia. And the previous record, it, it's more than doubled our previous record in Canada. So it's, as I say, uncharted waters. I'm, I'm trying to avoid the unprecedented word because it's kicked around so much. But that's, that's where we are. And uh, the fire season isn't over. And some of these fires will burn through winter. Even though there's snow in the ground, fires can burn in deeper organic layers and smolder and smolder. Spring comes, snow melts, gets warm, dry, and windy again, up pops the fire. Uh, some people call them zombie fires because you, you can't kill them. And if you think that's something, there's peat fires in Indonesia that have been burning for more than 30 years and lead to that regional haze problem. And that's where a lot of the premature deaths do well then fire smoke is from prolonged exposure to peat fires in Southeast Asia. Yeah, one tends to think of the obvious, you know, the people that actually die like uh, in Hawaii, in Maui, that you think, oh, they all died. But there's all this residual, there's the asthma, there's the, the heart problems you get, there's the breathing problems you get. Um, I, the Fetus development, IQ, the list goes on and on. And the more we know about wildland fire smoke, the more we realize how hazardous it is to our health. Especially the guys working, dealing with it. I mean, then... Yeah, you should wear a mask. Those N95 masks that became popular during COVID were actually developed for wildland fire smoke to keep the smaller particles out of your lungs. Uh, they, they do a pretty good job, but the really fine particles and some smoke get through the mask, unfortunately. Wow. So what's more, the second part of the article, you say extreme weather conditions around the globe are interconnected and insidiously self-accelerating. So mm. how is what's happening in the Arctic affecting air currents and the jet stream and these wild fluctuations of temperature and precipitation? I know that El Nino had some role in that, but what that combination, that lethal combination so maybe I'll talk briefly about extreme fire weather and climate change and then try and answer that question. Okay, so fire is driven by the extremes. If a fire starts on an average summer day and it's an unwanted fire, it's easy for fire management to put up. It's on those hot, dry, windy days. We call them spread days because that's when fires actively spread. In Canada, 3% of our fires burn, 97% of our area burned. It's even more dramatic in Western United States where 1% of the fires burn, 99% of the area burned. And those 1% happen on just a relatively small number of days of hot, dry, windy conditions. Those are what's driving. And that's what we've been seeing in Canada this fire season. And we're, we've done research around the globe. Many areas of the globe are seeing more hot, dry, windy days. And with climate change, we expect this to continue. I mentioned earlier, Jeff, that fire and temperature are intimately connected. And there's three reasons for this. Fire people love threes for some reason. But anyway, the first is the warmer it gets, the longer the fire season is. And that's very important for places like Canada, where our summer season, our fire season is relatively short. 
in California, they talk about fire year now. They don't ca call it a fire season because fires burn all year long. Second, the warmer it gets, the more lightning we see. And lightning is responsible for most of our area burned in Canada. And unlike human caused fires that are preventable, we really can't do much about lightning until we deal as a society with human caused climate change. And you know, the third reason is as the temperature increases, its ability to suck moisture out of the fuel, and here I'm talking about dead fuels in the forest floor, cured grass, dead needles and leaves, increases almost exponentially with temperature. So unless you see more rainfall to compensate from this for this drying from the warming, we're going to have drier fuels. And this is another critical piece to understand wildland fire. The drier the fuels, it's easier for a fire to start, easier for a fire to spread. And it means there's more fuel available to burn, which leads to higher intensity fires, bigger flames, which means they're challenging to impossible to extinguish. So that's what climate change is bringing to forest fires. Um, now, Climate change is also affecting our weather patterns, and our weather patterns really dictate the fire situation. There's something called omega block, and it's like the Greek letter omega, and it's just a high pressure system. And it's the opposite of your grade three water cycle. Air is sinking, warming, and drying. So it dries out all the fuels that stays there for a while. And the, the stagnant pattern is tied to the jet stream. So the jet stream gets its energy from the temperature difference between the Arctic areas and the equator in the Northern Hemisphere. The Arctic is warming at three to four times the rate of the rest of the globe, so that temperature difference is getting smaller. So instead of a fast-flowing river with our surface pressures, highs and lows going through every three to five days, and the low pressures bring rain every three to five days, you don't have a fire problem. But that river gets lazy, and you get eddies and whirlpools, and then you get those omega blocks forming, and stagnation, you get drought and fire where they are, and where the low pressures are, you get rain and flooding. And we're seeing record-breaking flooding this year in the United States, and right now it's occurring in Greece. They're talking about two feet of rain in Greece from a Medicaid, which is kind of like a, a Mediterranean hurricane. Uh, it's just crazy, and there's a recent paper out showing that the, the change from drought to flooding is increasing and how fast it's happening and how severe. And this is really important because when you have a drought, the, the soil gets like hard pan. And so when it does rain, it doesn't soak in, it just runs off. So this is what we're seeing is a warmer world with this lazy jet stream causing more extremes at both ends of the spectrum, heat, drought, fire, one end and rain, and flooding at the other end. Well, even if we haven't been in a hurricane, everybody has noticed distinct uh, extremes of weather wherever they live. Well, rainfall that comes on like a like a hose, and it just comes down like torrentially with no beginning tapering off. It's just absolutely torrential, and then lots of lightning and lots of thunder, more lightning than I've ever seen attached to a, a rainstorm. And that's getting to be the norm. And I think I was looking at the hurricane that went across Hawaii, and I was looking at the lightning strikes from the satellite. It's incredible, the number of lightning strikes peripheral to the hurricane. So I don't know if that's abnormal as well or, or not. So, so, you know, if you think things are wacky now, it's only going to get worse as we continue to warm. It's going to get crazier and crazier. And, you know, what, what's concerning for lots of reasons is even if I had a magic wand and said no more greenhouse gases being produced, all right, we'll continue to warm for decades, albeit not at the rate that we would if we, if we keep on pumping greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but there's lags in our climate system. So we're going to continue to warm for, for the foreseeable future. We have to get our act together and soon. Well, Jeff, in your book, you said that, quote, a heat wave is a predatory event that culls the most vulnerable people, but that's changing. As heat waves become more intense and more common, they will become more democratic. So could you explain that? Well, I mean, um, 
What I mean by that is that everyone is going to be suffering from the impacts of of extreme heat. And, you know, I think Mike did a really great job of um, when he was talking about wildfires and, and the sort of causes of wildfires and heat being one of them. I think one of the hardest things to understand about climate change is the these kind of cascading consequences that, you know, this accumulation of um, what might seem like small changes, uh, subtle shifts in temperature, um, escalating and cascading into these bigger and bigger events. And, and um, Mike's description of that was really excellent. And I think that that's similar to what we will see with heat waves, right? I mean, so you know, I describe heat as predatory in the book, and it is. It goes after the most vulnerable people first. You know, I live here in Texas. I'm in Austin right now. I just, on the way here, um, passed a bunch of workers who are putting in a water pipe on this in the street, and they're working out on black asphalt, um, you know, with construction gear on, and it's, I don't know, what, 105 and really humid here today. I mean, it is brutal. And, um, you know, hopefully they're taking water breaks and doing the things they need to do. Um, but for people who are working outdoors in this kind of weather, it is um, it is really, you know, dangerous. And in my book, I write about the death of a farm worker in Oregon during the Pacific Northwest heat wave from two years ago who, you know, died working in a field in Oregon Um because there were no labor laws requiring heat and water breaks, and he more or less had to choose between keeping his job or risking his life. Um, and he thought maybe he would be okay, and he thought he was strong, and he thought he was tough, and he wasn't, and he died. And he died of heat stroke. Um, so these kinds of things are the sort of obvious and direct predatory aspects. But as these heat waves get um, more common as they get uh, more extreme, everyone is going to be impacted by them, you know, uh, in direct and indirect ways. Uh, we talked about food crops, um, you know, changes in food production, diseases that we talked about earlier, too, with mosquitoes moving in different ways. Um, you know, in the kind of heat that we're having in Texas and that we've had all summer, run out of gas in your car on a deserted road and you're in big trouble really fast. I mean, things get complicated very fast and you think, oh, we're fine because we have air conditioning. Well, you're not fine if that air conditioning goes out. And if you have a blackout and, you know, one of the infrastructure experts in my book talks about who was in, uh, in Phoenix talks about what he called a, a hurricane, um, a heat Katrina referring to the Hurricane Katrina, which, you know, if on a on one of these extreme heat days in Phoenix, if you had a blackout and the grid is stressed during this time because everyone's cranking up their air conditioning, so there's likely to be blackouts in these kinds of weather, in these kinds of extremes, then all of a sudden, you know, your cozy house with, you know, 69 degrees or 70 degrees with air conditioning is all of a sudden a furnace or a convection oven. And there was a really interesting not just interesting, I think that's an understatement, terrifying, but very well-respected study that came out a few months ago showing that if there were a blackout during a heat wave in Phoenix, within 48 hours, half of the population, almost 400,000 people, would be in the emergency room and of hospitals, and 13,000 people would be dead within 48 hours. I mean, that is a horrific thing to consider, but true. So this notion that, you know, you're safe or I'm safe from heat events simply because I'm sitting in an air conditioning, I'm luckily not working outside, you know, putting in a water pipe is a very uh, fragile illusion. You, you raise some really good points, Jeff, in the book. You you talk about, well, parts of, obviously, this hits the poorest people. There are lots of people die in their apartments in poor sections of America just because they don't have an air conditioner and they just stoically stick it out and are found dead. But then there's parts of the world where you can't go in the shade because the shade is still a heat risk. It's actually, you're not only exposed sun, but you're still in the heat. So... 
you know, those places, there is no real escape. Um, well, I mean, you don't have to go very far to find that. You can find that on the east side of Austin here. I spent a lot of time in Phoenix in housing projects where, you know, low-income people live. And, you know, there's no trees. There's It's just asphalt, concrete, and, you know, and you mentioned people who don't have air conditioning, and which is certainly true. There are billions of people on this planet who don't have air conditioning and for all intents and purposes never will, even if we you know, democratize the air conditioning in some ways and subsidize the, the you know, the, the costs of buying and running air conditioners for all kinds of obvious reasons. There are billions of people who aren't going to have air conditioning. But what I find most kind of upsetting and, um, you know, the, the, the kind of unknown risk that I wrote about in my book is, you know, people who have air conditioning but don't have much money and can't afford to run it, or they can only afford to run it for an hour or so a day. And so they're constantly making a kind of arbitrage of like, do I want to have enough money to buy dinner or, or pay my rent? Or do I want to run my air conditioner for two more hours? And, you know, for some people, that's not a big issue. But for a lot of people who are in those kinds of situations, who have other health problems and things, that is a kind of death arbitrage. Because if you calculate that wrong, and you don't turn the air conditioning on, and your room, your temperature in your apartment goes up to 105 degrees, and it stays there, you know, for a day or so, and you're not in great health, you're in big trouble. And and so, you know, we don't have to go far to see the extreme risks that these kinds of heat events uh, bring to us as a society. I'm just going to field um, some questions that have come in from the audience here. I'm not sure if we can answer them all, but let's try. Um, what does getting our act together um, mean? You said that, Mike, I think. When the changes in the atmosphere and ocean appear to be already set up by the current levels of carbon dioxide. Mike, so I'll start and you can that clean up, Jeff, okay? <laughs> so to deal with human-caused climate change, we have to stop burning fossil fuels, okay? That's the first thing. And we have to go to renewables. And there's lots of options. And it's becoming more economically viable for these renewables as opposed to conventional fossil fuels. Um, you know, the insurance industry is coming into play here too because it's no longer economically viable to protect through insurance people's homes in various parts of the world now because of increasing nature of disasters. But we need individuals. We need local government, municipal governments, federal governments, global society, industry. We all have to start doing our part. And some of it is not going to be pleasant, you know, if we have to reduce our carbon footprint. And, you know, what, what does that mean? It means less air travel. Private planes should be essentially banned except for essential use. Uh, you know, there's just so many ways that we are adding greenhouse gases. And then there's things that the unknown unknowns, methane is increasing much faster than carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide, our current levels, we haven't seen for three and a half million years, okay? But methane is 20 to 80 times more effective as a greenhouse gas, and it's increasing uh, dramatically. Is it because of permafrost thaw? There's hydrates, primarily methane, and terrestrial and seabed. Uh, permafrost, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty is where this is coming from, but we really have to stop burning fossil fuels, all right? That's, that's the short answer. There's other ways that contribute, but that's the big one. Uh, all, over to you, Jeff. Well, I, I agree with everything you said. I would just underscore, you know, um, we do need to stop burning fossil fuels as soon as possible. But I also think it's important to underscore that every molecule of CO2 that is kept out of the air is progress, right? And so um, it's, you know, I think that people can get into a kind of doom loop that think, oh, we're never going to get off of fossil fuels. And so we're just completely screwed. And, you know, let's just go hide in the basement and, you know, 
scrawl on the wall in crayons about you know the our, our you know the fate of human civilization you know the fight is really important because every coal plant that is shut down every you know barrel of oil that stays in the ground is a better world for the future and so this it's not there's no kind of binary here right um that's really important to grasp and I, and i also would underscore that yes it's important to do our parts yes it's important to live a low carbon lifestyle all of that but this is a political problem and we need political action we need to we need to, to be pulling the big levers which is eliminating carbon subsidies uh, more transparency on lobbying costs and um, working on um, dismembering the political muscle of the fossil fuel industry to help accelerate all of these other kinds of progress of renew towards faster generation of a faster uptake of renewable energy and things like that. I, I just would underscore that this is really about, I think, about um, politics and political change, which is why voting, political activism, and all that is so important. Somebody else asked here, Edward, what can climate change have, what effect, I guess you mean, have on the major oceanic currents which affect weather events? Is that difficult to answer? Well, I'll take a quick stab at that. I mean, ocean uh, currents are hugely important in our weather and our climate. You know, the ocean is um, a big heat sink. 90% of the heat that is accumulated on uh, in the atmosphere has 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 gone into um uh the oceans uh, there's a lot of concern about a uh central circulation system um a kind of gulf stream circulation system called the amoc um that works off similar to the way mike described the jet stream working off the uh temperature differentials between the poles and the and the and the equator, there's a similar kind of, you could think of it as a jet stream in the ocean that works off of similar temperature differentials. And there's concerns about that slowing down. And if that slowed down, that would have a profound impact on the climate, especially in the Northern hemisphere. Um, there's a lot of study around that, a lot of uncertainty around that. There have been some studies that just came out in the last six months or so that suggested that that um, circulatory system is beginning to slow down. Um, but there's still a lot of um, uh, unknowns about the ocean. It's vitally important to our climate system. Um, I don't know, Mike, do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, just as Iceland and Antarctica melt, there's a lot more fresh water, which also complicates the circulation right. system. Right. Um, someone called Rich says, are you anticipating wide swathes of the continent to become uninhabitable with weeks long heat waves if an area loses power? It's kind of hard to predict, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, virtually <clears throat> any hot place, um, if an area loses power, um, is going to be uh, in tough shape for as long as it takes to um, get that power back up. Uninhabitable usually means sort of a, a kind of longer term kind of um, uh, problem. I mean, but but the, the big issue with questions like this, which are important, is um, uninhabitable for who, right? I mean, there's a vast differential in people's ability to deal with extreme heat and ex all kinds of extreme climate uh, um, impacts, depending on, you know, how much money you have, how how mobile you are, how good of health you're in. Um, you know, there's, it, it's a not a equally distributed risk, whether it's extreme heat or flooding or drought or whatever. Um, people's risks are very different. So when we think about this question of you know, will it be uninhabitable or not, or how will it affect us? The the real difficult part of that question is who is the us or the we that we're talking about? Well, it, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah, go ahead. It, it's interesting because, you know, since the 2021 heat event in the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia, I'm getting emails from people. So it's on people's minds. Where can I go to avoid the heat? Where can I live to avoid the smoke? So this is now part of our consciousness, which, you know, I wasn't getting emails like this 
until recently. So it is affecting the way people think. Um, you were talking about who's responsible for this. Well, you're totally right about the government failing to act uh, and moving, forcing fossil fuel uh, companies to meet targets. In fact, letting them off. Um, there was an opinion piece in The Guardian last month which went after the worst climate offenders, which in fact are the super rich. No surprise there. It has been shown that the world's wealthiest 10% are responsible for 40% of global emissions. So think of the ramifications of that 10% of the population changed their ways, the instant impact it would have on almost half global emissions. While emissions from low and middle income groups within rich countries declined trying to do the right thing. Is there a way that either of you can think of for us to go after the chief offenders, maybe by taxing their superfluous private planes or the vast houses with infinite air conditioning. Any thoughts from either of you gentlemen? Frank, you want to go first? That's, that's a hard one. You know, I think it's important that we tax carbon, and that's what we do in Canada and in British Columbia. And it's much more effective than some of the other techniques. Um, so you want to use carbon? you pay for it. And the more you use, it should be on an accelerated scale. You pay a lot more. Um, at least that's a starting point. But I, I think private jet should be banned, you know, to a large degree. But I'll stop there before I get Good luck with that. Yeah. You know, luck. yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that, that um, you know, study that you've cited that has been widely quoted um, uh you know, of the top 10% of the income of income earners being responsible for 40% of carbon pollution is really important because first of all, it, it, it cuts against this argument that is often made that there's just too many people on the planet. And, you know, certainly having seven or 8 billion people on the planet, you know, matters a lot in all kinds of ways for biodiversity and land use and all kinds of ways. But when you look at it from a carbon point of view, the real problem is not too many people. It's too many people is a smallish number of people consuming way too much. So that, you know, people, you know, I did a lot of reporting in my book in Africa and in India and, you know, both of places which have booming populations, but the carbon footprint of people in those places is minuscule compared to my carbon footprint. And I live, very low carbon lifestyle for most uh, by most american standards i have a heat pump in my house i have a small house i drive a, a hybrid car i ride my bike everywhere i mean do all these sorts of things but then when you think about the super rich or even the medium rich who have you know ten thousand foot homes uh fly private jets around have six suvs in in their in their garages then you see why there is political tension between the you know the the wealthy north and the developing south in global climate negotiations, because basically, you know, and in my view, rightfully so, and why this is such an economic and social justice issue is because the global south, the developing world is saying, hey, you guys are the ones who are causing the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and not only are you causing it by your, your private jets and your 10,000 square foot houses, but because CO2 is a historic problem also, because CO2 stays in the atmosphere, you guys have used up all of the space in the atmosphere and we're getting all the impacts down here. We're having crop failures. We're having droughts. We're having extreme heat waves, all of these problems. We don't have the, we're not wealthy enough to deal with this. You basically, you cause the problem. So you need to help us pay for this. And one of the, I would say the central friction point in, in international climate negotiations right now is, is what does the wealthy North owe the developing South for these impacts? You know, there's this thing called the Green Carbon Fund that has $100 billion in it that never quite, the, 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 the North never quite uh, ends up funding the way they should. And but, but this question of equity and justice is fundamental to how we think about um, uh, moving forward, not just with solving climate change, but with um, uh, uh, how we deal with the equity and fairness issues that are at the heart of this problem. Very good point. Very good point. 
but that we're all dumped on, in fact, un unfairly, they're getting a great deal more. You know, some of the islands are being completely destroyed and these people have almost contributed nothing to the problem. It it seems very, um, very wrong. Um, of course, some people are doing good stuff. You know, architects are designing better houses, smaller houses, heat pumps, solar panels, trying to be off the grid as much as possible. I mean, some people are going great guns and getting rid of asphalt in areas, putting more trees in. I mean, all this stuff takes time. But really, the chief problem is, is taking carbon out of the air, right? We've got to get the carbon out of the air somehow. Any suggestions about what methods are most promising? Well, I'll, I'll take a quick stab at this. I would say the first problem is not getting carbon out of the air. The first problem is stopping putting it into the air. I mean, that's 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 what's important, right? So we need to stop putting billions of tons of carbon into the air every year, right? And then once we stop doing that, then we can start to think about taking carbon out of the air. But until we stop putting it in, the idea of taking it out is very problematic. And there is... Um, a, a, a kind of growing industry in um, Canada and in the United States of carbon removal systems that are basically giant machines that kind of act like trees and suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. And the idea is you pull it out of the atmosphere and then you bury it underground, geologically sequester it. And, you know, in 100 years, that may, in fact, be a really important technology. But right now, it's really, really expensive. It doesn't work anywhere near the scale. The, I mean, the scaling problems are, 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 are enormous. And it's basically becoming a tool to allow the fossil fuel industry to continue um, to give, a, give the fossil fuel industry a kind of license to continue to operate, to say that we can, that we can create carbon free oil which which is basically will continue to you know pump the oil out of the ground and burn it but we're going to build these other machines that are going to suck the co2 out of the ground so it's okay and that is a very um uh, uh that is not a step a big step forward let me put it that way mike do you want to add to that or no just that you know, it may be uh, the courts that may play a role here, just like they do with big tobacco, uh, because big oil has known for years that burning fossil fuels would warm our planet. And some of the research they did was pretty well bang on as about how much warming they'd, we'd see. So they knew they're responsible, and I expect the court cases to start rolling in. That's a great point. I, and I, I just want to underscore one thing, which is um, I think that's really true. And I, I wrote a chapter in my book about the kind of growth of attribution science that, you know, uh, scientists are now able. It used to be when we talked about these extreme events, people like Jim Hansen of NASA, the kind of godfather of climate science would say, would use the metaphor of loaded dice, right? That, you know, yes, um, you know, uh, as we as we put more CO2 in the atmosphere, it, it makes th these wildfires or these droughts or these extreme heat events more likely, but we can't say that, that mm -hmm. it actually is responsible for any particular one. Well, with attribution science, and I won't go into the details of it, you can read it about it in my book if you want, but we're able to much clearer say, no, this was caused by higher levels of CO2. In fact, and not every event is is um you know do can they point their fingers to but the the um heat wave in the pacific northwest was one that they were able to point to and say basically this would have been impossible um without the additional co2 in the atmosphere so once you can make that link and say okay this event this particular event was caused by the additional co2 in the atmosphere which came from burning fossil fuels, then what Mike is talking about, about this kind of litigation, and you begin to think about the oil industry much more like you thought about the tobacco industry. And I think that that is absolutely, I agree, the, the sort of future of where things are going with this. Well, we actually did a program on this last year. So if anyone missed it, you should pull it up called the 64 year climate change cover up with Jeff Dembicki, who's another Canadian journalist who looked into this and actually got all the papers showing that 
Mobile and Exxon had all this research 64 years ago, uh, good good science showing the temperature increases and did exactly what the tobacco industry did, contorted it, put a spin on where we can't be sure or it might happen or it might not happen. Um, and so it was was buried. So they they definitely had the pockets to fill the problems, solutions for sure. Um, so we're getting close to the last five minutes of the program. There've been a lot of very good comments and questions. Um, and, and somebody said, you can't solve climate change if you don't solve politics. Dr. Ed Cameron, one of the architects of the earliest Paris for Climate Accord. Um, and then people saying, how do we get generally people to care about the future? Um, someone asking about phytoplankton extinction in the ocean. I don't know if that's a particularly specific question. That's really yeah. about marine biology. So I can interrupt while we have a few minutes left. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, one of the questions I get is, is there any hope? And I'd like to hear Jeff's, you know, comment on this as, as well. And I, I still have some hope. It's dwindling, okay? And, you know, as I've been studying climate change for decades, and originally I was concerned about my, my children's future, or now my grandchildren's future, but now I'm thinking about my future, and, you know, I'm not a spring chicken anymore, that it's going to have dramatic impacts on us. But I'm still hopeful that human behavior, we can change. And sometimes it takes bloody noses. And so we're getting the bloody noses. We're getting multiple bloody noses. So it's time for us to act. So hopefully we have the will <laughs> and the wherewithal to act. Okay. Well, yeah. Jeff, you, you quoted W.B. Yeats um, in your book, uh, paraphrasing, before there was light, there was heat. It's the origin of all things and the end of all things which was um, a bit apocalyptic there. But um, what, what do you feel? Well, I, I, in the way I quoted that, I didn't, so you didn't mean it to be apocalyptic. I, I'm not a doomer at all. I don't feel like we're living through an apocalypse. I feel like we're living through one of the greatest challenges that humans have ever faced. Um, I feel like, you know, before we can really talk about solutions in any kind of meaningful way, we have to really fully understand the scope and scale of what we face, which is why work that people like Mike do. And the reason I wrote this book is to try to help people understand the scope and scale of what we face. But I also feel like this is a moment of tremendous opportunity because so much is up for grabs. You know, we are going to have to and we are going to change our energy system. We're going to change how we get energy. We are going to change how we build cities. We are going to change how we grow food and where we grow food. Um, all this stuff you know, are, is going to happen. And if I think because there's so much at stake, if we get politically involved, if we get active in helping to shape this future, it's a tremendous opportunity to build a better world. I mean, there's not like the world we live in is like perfect. I mean, every time I drive by a strip mall here in Austin, I'm like, oh my God, this place is horrific. You know, I mean, we can do better than what we've got, right? And I think that, you know, I my hope is that we can use this moment of cataclysmic change to build a better world. And I do think that, you know, that is within our grasp. That's great. I mean, very uplifting. Um, you know, I'd like to think that we can leave the world in a better place than what we found it. And so far, we're we're failing. We're failing miserably at it. But we there's opportunity. I agree 100 percent with you, Jeff. Well, I'm glad we were able to end end on a slightly optimistic note. Um, you know, if enough good people do the right thing. That's basically what it takes for change to shift. So I'd like to thank both of our amazing speakers today um, for giving of their time and their precious insights in this problem um, and making time to all for all the audience that came online. There was quite a number of you, and I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions, but there were a lot of them. I'd just like to say Cambridge Forums made possible through the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter, the Lowell Institute, Mass Cultural Council, the Cambridge Community Foundation, and you guys. 
So step up if you haven't given us anything in a while. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jeff. And thank everyone for joining us. See you soon. Bye-bye.